It's Sunday, October 13th, 2019, and this is the Product Mentor Talk. Today, we're joined by Jordan Bertram, who's going to be talking about getting the most out of the PMs on your team. Allow me to briefly explain the format. The Product Mentor Program is a program that happens twice a year where mentees from around the world are paired with experienced mentors in the product management field and uh, being able to work with them on a weekly basis towards a set of uh, common goals and uh, really is very valuable to the mentees and the mentors uh, when it comes to learning from each other. Um, we're going to be joined by mentors today that are part of the program and they're going to be presenting special topics that are close to their hearts. Um, so we are joined by uh, all of the mentees uh, today so and mentors. So if uh, people want to just wave hi really quickly <laughs> and say hi, um, good to see everybody. Um, and um, what we're going to be doing today is I would like to first start with some introductions by everybody. So uh, I'll just uh, call on everybody uh, individually, but then if you could give me your name, location, your role, and then whether you're a mentor or mentee. So let's start uh, with uh, Jordan. I'm Jordan Bergtram. I'm located in New York City. Uh, I am a mentor in the program, and I am the head of product for Equip ID. Uh, hey all, I'm Andras. I'm located in Slovenia, Ljubljana. I'm a product manager and I'm a mentee in this uh, program. Great, thank you. Vivek, when are you next? Hi all, uh, this is Vivek uh, uh, from Bangalore. A uh, company called Recipe. I'm a mentee in the program. Great. Uh, Fabi? Hello. I'm, my name is Fabiola Borges, and I'm living at, in Mexico City. I'm currently head of product of Una HR, a startup. Um, yeah, but I'm originally from Chile, not from Mexico. Great. And uh, John? Uh, hi there, I am John Masterson and I am based in London. Um, I'm actually originally from Ireland, but based in London in the UK. Um, I'm a mentor in this program um, and I'm the Chief Product Officer at a startup here in London called Improve Well. Great, thank you. Good to see everybody today. And um, we do have a few other mentors and mentees that were not able to make it, um, but you know, very happy to everybody have everybody here. Uh, so uh, please do post any questions you have to the Q&A section of the productmentor.com slash live. And uh, this will then chat on YouTube. And then as questions come in, I'll jump in and pass them on to our mentor during the talk. So I am Chris Butler, and I'm Chief Product Architect at IPSoft. I'm also a mentor and mentor lead um, as part of the Product Mentor group here. Um, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's live stream. So uh, without further ado, uh, Jordan, why don't you go ahead and take it away? This morning, or for the, some of you this afternoon, I'm going to discuss with you ways to get the most out of your product management team. This discussion will probably be most interesting to those of you that either are or have aspirations to be managing um, or have some oversight responsibility for your product team. However, given many of you are not in that position, I do strongly believe that a lot of the techniques I'll be discussing with you will be helpful even when you're dealing with your product management peers as well. And you'll see why in a second. My background. I have 13 years of B2B SaaS experience. So I view things through a certain lens. And I think that lens when you're in B2B versus B2C versus internal tools varies. So I just like to let people know um, where my experience is. Um, I understand the B2C and B2 and internal tools world. I actually did work in the internal tools world uh, ages ago, um, but never B2C. So just keep that in mind. Uh, for seven years, I've been leading product management teams, leading meaning resp line responsibility for other product management professionals, UX professionals, project management professionals as well. Also, that leadership comes with a port product portfolio strategy and direction. I've been in a number of different, very different domains that did not have any relationship. So I've gotten very comfortable coming into new verticals and having to learn them quickly, everything from legal to pharma, education, and most recently, I'm currently in the facilities management domain. 
And twice I've had the pleasure of introducing product management to an organization, meaning it was an organization that did not have an official product management function. And one of the reasons they were bringing me on was to introduce them to uh, not just the processes and procedures, but the value of having dedicated and trained professional product managers on staff. Historically, I've done um, a number of different things that are probably not uh, unobvious, but everything from the market research that goes into uh, product direction and strategy, uh, the product marketing that goes into the outbound messaging associated with launching a product and coming up with messages that will interest a market and interest them enough that they want to pay for that solution and hopefully pay a lot of money to you for that solution. I've also been responsible for roadmaps and the overall um, product delivery as well. So let's just outline what you'll get out of this presentation up front so we'll set expectations. I'm going to discuss what I think the problem is. I, there's always a problem out there that we're looking to address. Then, of course, I will discuss uh, potential solutions. I also want to take a moment to have a reality check around that solution and the fact that sometimes things uh, admittedly sound a more ideal than they are um, reality, and I recognize that. So let's just dive right into the problem I see that is out in the world. So product management is an incredibly broad function and discipline. I, I Truthfully, I can't think of a broader discipline, maybe short of being the CEO of an entire company. Um, I, I don't see the breadth and, and other roles that, that we have to deal with. So let me just very you know, quickly go through all of the things that I think we need to deal with as part of doing end-to-end -end product management. So right, the interviews ideation, win-loss analysis, prioritization, road mapping, competitive intelligence, communicating, messaging, process flows, pricing, research, designing a product, backlog planning, estimating. Anyone exhausted yet, by the way, because I'm already, and by the way, I'm not even done. There are a few more. User stories and authoring those. Escalating engineering and QA issues that come your way. Performing user acceptance testing. Training, demos. Okay, fine, I'm done. Okay, but you get the point. Point is we get involved in so many different things and these things are not all related at all in my mind. In other words, related in the sense that they don't require the same personality types, the same experiences and the same skills. They're they require a very, um, very multidisciplinary type approach to your role. So what that leads to is I would never expect an individual to love all of those things and want to get involved deeply in all those things and have passion for all of those items I just showed you. That's just not realistic. Let's just live in the real world and recognize that, especially in product, given the breadth of the role, that no one's going to like all components of the job. Now, outside, it's even harder, okay, not just to love it all, but it's even harder to find someone that can do it all at an A level, right? That's just, again, it's like asking someone to take on the responsibility of running um, your accounting, HR, and sales function all at the same time. You know, you're a small company and you're just going to have one person do all that. No one would ever do that. Why? For obvious reasons. And yet in product, our expectations are almost as varied in terms of the skills that go into doing all those, uh, those those varied things that I just showed you on the prior slide. And the other problem is people tend to gravitate and want to put their heart, soul, effort, time into their strengths. Obviously, it's what we, we gravitate to is what we're good at. But the problem is, the real problem is, that's not what we gravitate towards and what we're good at isn't always the most important thing we should be working on. So we have to have that discipline to recognize that maybe we're spending a little too much time on the things we enjoy at the peril of the things that need to be done that are super important that we don't love. So that, that's the problem I see is how do we handle that, those, that situation where we know 
We have a lot to do. We're not going to love it all. We're not going to be great at it all. Yet we need to arguably do it all. So let's start talking about potential solutions. First, let's figure out what people enjoy. Meaning you have to have a conversation with them and determine like, what are you into? Like, what are, what are the big buckets of things that really turn you on? Now, sometimes it doesn't require a conversation, by the way. Sometimes it just wa- it requires watching them do their job. And as someone that has, you know, managed other product people, it is kind of easy for me in that role to recognize what people are interested in by just talking to them, listening to what they tend to want to talk about, what excites them, and not just what they talk about, but what they talk about that excites them. So it could be things like strategy, the market research part of our job, designing products, product marketing. So, sorry, moving on. Uh, just so that what I'm suggesting is understand that first. Understand the broad areas of product that excites them. Next, I think it also helps to understand not just what they love, but what they're good at. Because often these two things go hand in hand, but not necessarily. Sometimes people get really excited and they're interested in things that they're not necessarily amazing at. And in part because um, maybe they're actively pursuing it because they do want to get better at it. So they're developing a passion for it. But the reality of, of people are sometimes they love things that they're not amazing at. It does happen. It's maybe not as common as... Um, gravitating and falling in love with the things you're good at. But just know that, that that they're technically two different things. So again, same similar questions. Figure out what are their skills? Is it, again, strategy, research, designing software or whatever the product might be, or the product marketing where they love coming up with you know really lofty and, and beautiful messages that excite a marketplace? Let's also learn their motivators. So what do I mean by motivators? So what really are they, why do they have that their job? What drives them? What makes them wake up in the morning, want to get out of bed? And you know what, what is that? So for some people, it could be changing people's lives. For other, they view things through the lens of, I just want my company to succeed and do well. For others, let's just be honest, it could be financial incentives. And for some people, it's, you know, a little on the nose, it's praise that what motivates them is hearing that they're doing a good job from other people. So another solution is think about how you can put people on the right product. So for example, if they have an artistic slant, I would suggest seeing if you have a redesign project that is currently going on. And what I mean by redesign is a um, type of project where there is an existing legacy product that exists and it is time to start maybe from scratch. You know, the, the functionality is still holds true, but let's say it's mostly, you're not necessarily redesigning in the back end or the middle tier, but it's mostly the front end that you're redoing because you've come to recognize that your uh, experience is dated or, and now look, don't get me wrong, redesigns also involve sometimes re-architecture behind the scenes. But oftentimes, what I, the point I'm making here is, if you know that you have a product person who has a um, love for UX without wanting to be a UX professional, because that's always another option, is they're in the wrong job. But if they truly want to stay a product person, that a redesign project can be great for them because the biggest issue in a redesign oftentimes is, let's just scrap the existing front end and redo that. And when that's their passion, that's a great project for them. Another example could be um, for someone that's really into strategy, uh, put them on new product development, throw them out there to do a lots of market research and look at what's going on out in your marketplace for brand new product opportunities um, and, and problems that are out there that need to be solved that you guys think you can solve and that there's you know, money involved in solving that problem for the marketplace. So let's imagine you have someone that's just a really good taskmaster. They are incredibly good at just seeing a problem come in. It comes in and they are very disciplined about figuring out of the few problems that have just come in, which ones to do first, quickly prioritize those, and then work with their uh, team to get them done. So a potential place for that person could be maintenance. And I know a lot of people shy away from maintenance because it kind of has a... 
connotation of being not the most exciting part. But for the right person, maintenance could be an incredibly in, uh, rewarding job for someone that thinks along the lines of, hey, I love to see, let's say, you know, defects come in. I know, understand how painful they can be for my customers. And all I want to do is get those solved for our customers and keep the product um, running in a way that it should. I love that. And there are definitely people that are out there that, that, that do uh, derive satisfaction of just keeping the product in that, you know, steady state condition. And when they see it like dipping because of defects, they, they love to just tackle that. And let's say you have someone that, that is really um, excited about data uh, and data is there, they're, you know, it's something they're super interested in. We'll obviously put them maybe on, you know, business intelligence platforms or integrations. Let's also consider things like putting them in the right role as well. So now, of course, we're here to talk about product management, but there's no, not no shame in recognizing that you might currently be in a product management role or you notice someone else is in a product management role, but they shouldn't be. And maybe really what they should be doing is product ownership. And for those of you who maybe don't necessarily appreciate the distinction between product manager and product owner, and by the way, this gets defined you know, slightly differently in different uh, organizations, but at a simple level, uh, I found that when you have both roles in the same company, the product manager is setting the direction on what problems are we going to solve in what order. And then the product owner sort of takes it from there. Once the order of the problems to be solved is understood, they take that first problem and it's their responsibility to go out and then de design the right solution to that problem from the you know, product design perspective, working closely, of course, with UX and engineering on that. But there, it's a, it's, they get closer to the execution part of actually making it happen um, from the you know, development perspective. Yeah, so uh, Candace actually had a question. Uh, how to balance between putting a product manager on the right project and stretching on something uh, they are not good at? Well, that, oh, okay. Well, that, that is one of the points I was making is do your best. And sometimes you have no choice given the projects that are available and the people that are available, of course, but try to match that up uh, in a way that um, you are putting the right person on the right project or product based on all those things I was talking about, like their uh, skills, interests, motivators, um, what excites them and, and match that up for the simple reason that you, as you'd imagine, people will excel and do better on projects that they are good at, excited about, and motivates them from a, you know, an emotional standpoint. Now, you know, how you, you match that up is there's a lot of art that goes into figuring that out. But like, I think those three levers are where you start. You know, what are they good at? And does that align with the project? What motivates them? And uh, what, do, what do they personally love? Great, that's really excellent. Thank you. Go ahead and uh, take it back over, Jordan. Recognizing that some people that are in product maybe shouldn't be in product. Maybe they should be UX professionals. Happens a lot. I've actually seen that transition happen a few times uh, in my, uh, my, my personal experience. The other area is perhaps that there are product managers that really are truly born to be project managers um, as opposed to um, product managers. Also, and, and here's a, a, I will admit this, topic was an interesting one for me to think about where I was thinking, try to put them on the right team. And by team, what I mean is pairing, thinking about who are they going to be working with, who they are, again, their, their interests and talents and motivators, and seeing if you can actually match them and pair them with, if it's within your um, you know, purview to do so, with the right team members. So I think when it comes to, for example, putting them on the, with the, the right engineers and QA, there may be some flexibility there as you work with the engineering function on which engineers may be on which teams and then which product person would be matched with them. And I think there's a, you know, I'm not going to go into like how to figure out, you know, which personality types will work well together. That would be a whole, you know, other discipline that I am probably not properly trained to assess because I did not, you know, study psychology at any point in my, uh, you know, professional or education so won't go there, but as you could get my point, which is at least think about that a little bit, um, especially from the engineering curate perspective. But I'd also say, think about the individuals in the other departments they may have a lot of interaction with, like 
sales and client success. And again, see if there's opportunity to pair the right people together for success. People that will work well together based on your, you know, the, like I said earlier, the art that goes into, you know, thinking to yourself, who, which, which two kids will play well together in the sandbox and produce a lovely sandcastle as opposed to just throwing the sand at each other. And then you have crying that no one really wants. Hey, Jordan, I have another uh, couple questions. Um, so Vivek, if, if you want to take a, take a moment uh, to um, ask your question. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of questions, Jordan. Uh, first is in terms of you mentioned about uh, maintenance of tasks. I assume that is mostly around sprint planning and, you know, um, uh, managing the sprint. So shouldn't that be actually be taken up by a scrum master or a technical program manager rather than a PM owning that activity? So maybe there's a little confusion there. By maintenance, I was really referring to um, a defects and maybe a technical debt, paying that down, and anything related to keeping a performance tasks, you know, keeping the product at a steady state, not maintaining a backlog, two very, very different things. And at the end of the day, if you think about it, uh, every product person has to maintain a backlog. That's a given. That's part of the job, huh. you know, regardless of, uh, <laughs> you know, of anything. So uh, that's what I meant by, by maintenance. Sorry if that, there was confusion there. Jordan, is that true that everybody has to maintain a backlog? I, I feel like that is, that, is that not a controversial so- topic in product management? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I'd like to think... Uh, all product managers are maintaining a, a, a backlog, at least some list somewhere that is prioritized. Perhaps right. I shouldn't call it a backlog. All right, I'm not going to make this my talk, but uh, thank you for answering that question. Vivek, did you have any other yeah. questions? The, the next question I had uh, for you, Jordan, is that uh, spoke about product owners, right? Uh, so in Indian uh, product management ecosystem, we don't have product owners. Can you just elaborate a bit on that? Is product owner the same as business analyst? Um, oh, it's a good question. So there is a lot of overlap in what I think people used to call a business analyst and a product owner. Yes. Um, I think product owners um, are just a newer, yeah, a newer way of looking at that. And also, uh, just also be careful in the financial sector. I've noticed business analysts mean something quite different than the way we use it in product uh, and financial services. Business analysts typically are people that are uh, generating a lot of reports and and data and and data manipulation and, and that. So, that's not what I mean by by BA. I mean BA and our, our let's say our world. Yeah, a BA and a product owner are similar. Um, and look, and, and there are plenty of companies out there that don't have both roles. It, it's typically uh, product owners typically something you see in product uh, organizations at scale when they get large enough that it actually makes sense to start to break down the role, the product, the traditional product management role into those two components. Um, and there are pros and cons to that. I know there are some people that hate the idea. There are some people that love the idea. It, that that in it, among itself is controversial in terms of wait, shouldn't one person do all that one job? That sounds crazy. You know, you're going to break up the role and and you're going to lose things in communication. How does that make sense? Um, mm-hmm. I could the counter argument to it is let the right tool do the right job because again, like I was saying earlier, product management is so broad. How do you expect one person to be an A level talent at all of those things? It'd be easier if you broke them down into two chunks and find people that you know will excel at just this chunk, and then another person uh, at just this chunk. So um, that 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 that's the my talk on product ownership. So sorry, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. It does. Thank you so much. No problem. Great. And and actually, there was one more question um, from Vishal Asha. There are always bugs in any release and should one wait for all bugs to get resolved or just go ahead with a new feature? Oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> that I, might do, be a whole nother talk, but, uh, that, yeah, that is, yeah, that's all the talk, but I'll give you my short answer, which is, um, a, um, no, all defects should not be fixed. Okay. That, that just like all work should not be done. You only have so many resources to, um, to tackle work and, um, you could, first of all, in, in my experience, the defects alone could overwhelm a team if you tried to do them all. Okay. Do not expect to do them all. So it, even if you did decide to try to you know, have your team do nothing but defects and do no new features, you still probably wouldn't get to do all the defects that you have in front of you. Okay. Once your product is at scale, I think that's uh, true. Once it's early and small, maybe, maybe that's not the case. So 
the the last point I want to make on that is your your defects as they come in need to be prioritized against your features in the just use the same tools you would in terms of its prioritization and and those are just different types of work that need to be done work is work you need to prioritize defects against um, all the other work now the one other thing I'll say and I have done this with a fair amount of success is, and again, this only works when you get to scale where you're large enough that you have enough resources to break uh, teams down. Um, you can have a dedicated maintenance team that all they do is worry about defects and keeping the product at a steady state. Advantage of that being that you're not constantly interrupting your feature-based teams with defects where it makes it almost impossible for you to predict outputs because you can't predict defects. So that's one of the advantages of having a dedicated uh, maintenance team that is responsible for handling the defects as they come in. So that's just my, my, my quick talk on that. But yeah, that is a whole, whole discussion in itself to really answer it. <laughs> Great. Well, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it away? So just to wrap this up, think about your product people and the other people in the organization they'll be working with and see if there's an opportunity to create, like I said earlier, um, that same sandbox environment where they will make beautiful sand. Another solution to this concern is set goals for people and not processes and procedures. Make sure it's their measurable expectations, of course, right? It's very easy to give someone a goal. It's much harder to measure that they've achieved that. I think we all know that. I think we've all been given um, goals that are good and measurable and goals that are bad because they either seem unmeasurable or arguably unachievable in the real world. So um, set good goals. Uh, without good goals, you have no goals in my mind. And give people the freedom to figure out how to get to that goal. I think what you will find as you deal with other people, if you're not this type of person, but most people, is they are a lot happier in their job if they are left to figure out the pathway to get to the destination as opposed to you saying take you know 41st street to 8th avenue to you know 71st street to and, and that takes all of the creativity out of their lives and it also sometimes can be read by that person as you don't trust them not to just drive in circles right like have a little faith in people um give them at least enough um latitude and have enough faith in them that they'll figure out how to get to the goal and it, look and then eventually if they they show that they can't do that then that's an issue that you know obviously needs uh attention and maybe that person uh, does need more uh direction processes and procedures than others and that's fine some people will struggle on how to get to the goal and um hopefully those people though will recognize their personal um, limitations or struggles getting to a certain goal and, and hopefully ask for help. There is no shame in asking for help. So the whole point is let them do it their way, not your way. Don't just assume your way is the best. Um, this is just, you know, a lot of like dealing with people type, um, you know, example that I'm using of, um, yeah, with, with that freedom, I think you'll see that you're going to get more output out of people, more happiness. They're likely to stay at the company longer and work harder for you or with you. Great. We have a quick question um, from Fabi. So why don't you uh, go ahead and uh, ask that, ask your questions. So, yeah, my question was, uh, what happens when the company stage requires more roles related to new features rather than redefine or others? So, and you still have some PMs better doing redesign uh, rather than new features. How can you mobilize, mobilize them towards strategy? Is there any way to do that? Well, oof. Okay, that's, that is a good question. So... And this is this is as part of the reality check of you know it's easy for me to say do these things, but when you're in this situation that you realize, wow, I have um, most of my PMs are strategists, love strategy, and really none of them want to take on maintenance, right? As an example, um, and uh, yeah, and in in that situation, you have limited options. Obviously, someone's got to do the work. You're going to put someone on it, okay, and. Yeah, you know, what are your other options? So 
what you can do is you could theoretically rotate people through that, the stuff that they don't like. That's one option. There is some downside to rotating PMs uh, through projects because you lose the opportunity to um, develop expertise. But within maintenance, you could argue maybe expertise isn't super critical, so it won't be that bad. But then you also make the argument, wait, so you're going to take PMs off their current project in the middle of the project to go do maintenance on a rotating cycle? How does that work? And my answer to that could be, yeah, might not work. Um, it, yeah, so th there's a challenge there. Or you don't take them off of their project, but they are still responsible for maintenance, so they're overburdened for a period of time. Again, is that going to work? So there is no easy answer to your question about, hey, when you have a mismatch between your needs, okay, like the buyers and the sellers, right? And it's, it's a market, right? Here's the projects that I need to, you know, to sell to people. Here are my buyers and none of them want to buy maintenance. Yeah, like, yeah, that's a, that's a tough marketplace to be in. And what you do is you force sell it onto that someone. And sometimes that's life, right? Like, and, and trust me, as someone that's managed, product managers, I've had to put people on product, products and projects that they were not excited about. Um, now, um, and, and you'll see, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it uh, in a second. The one thing I will do to them to try to get them bought into taking this project on just a little bit is explain to them the value of that product, why this is important that we do it. And I'll talk more about it in, in a second. You'll see in a future slide using that technique, you know, to, to try to motivate them when they're on something they don't love. Fabi directed us right into my next slide, which is add, give value to everything, right? Just because someone's not excited about it doesn't mean you can't get them excited about it. If you explain to them what the out come will be if they are successful in this project in terms of revenue in terms of retention in terms of just like overall customer love um or you know uh, cross selling upselling uh, you know things like sorry I was losing my terminology um you know click throughs um transition from freemium to to paying customers all of those things like and, and talk through like what's the win here from every angle, from you know, the, right, like the financial to the benefit to our customers to how happy the C level in our organization will be, that this is a highly visible project that it will get you. If and, you know, you may, this may not be your favorite, but you do it well, you you get a lot of credibility, and then the next you'll you'll get your pick of next projects potentially. Now maybe that's too strong to say you'll get your pick, but we'll take that into account. Is something maybe you could say? There's always certain ways to to. You know, let you know, motivate people when they're given something that you know up front they may not be super excited about. So, you know, that's one way. Um, you know, talk, I guess covered why, you know, tell them why this is important uh, to the company, to the customers, all that. And at the end of the day, keep something in mind. Sometimes, you know, what you need to remind people of is that in order to be a rock star in a company, you got to do it all. Okay. Like you just, you just got to do it. You got to, you know, Put on your big boy pants and just and just get it done and do it well. And even if you don't love it and even if you don't like it, that's that's one of the ways. You know, if, if you think about the the people that are great at what they do, the odds of them loving everything they do, not not so high. But they still do it all and they do it well and they do it with a they do it well and they do it with a smile on their face. There's something to be said for that. And I know that sounds you know a little lofty, but I I do believe that. So let's just very quickly, just, you know, a reality check. I live in the real world. I know a lot of what I'm talking about here is somewhat lofty, theoretical, easier said than done. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm no fool. I, I've done enough of these presentations to know that, you know, they, they are, here's, you know, here's what, what you should aspire, aspire, aspire to do. So, and the reality is like, I was just saying this, this is a good lead in. Everyone has to do the unfun parts of their job. Okay, this is true, not in product, but you know, if you're in sales, HR, and accounting, the three I used before, funny enough, or you're even the CEO of a company, do you think the CEO loves every part of what they do? I am sure they do not. Okay, so just accept that there are going to be parts of the job you don't love, you don't want to do, but you just got to do it anyway. That's just, that's why it's working, not a hobby. We get to pick our hobbies. We don't get to pick everything in our job that we do and then just say, I'm not going to do others. And also, I also recognize you can do everything in your power that you're thinking you can to motivate someone to get excited about a product project and it will fail. Okay. You cannot just control people. We all know that. All you can do is try, try your best to excite them about what they're working on and accept the fact that sometimes that person, you're just not reaching them. 
And that, that will happen. And lastly, let's just all like get on board with the concept of sometimes and oftentimes just do it. Okay. You just have to get the work done. Okay. I recognize that as well, that you can't just say no to certain parts of your job that are important to getting to your goals. You just do it. So I'm looking at my watch and we do have uh, time. So I'm going to give you a little bonus content um, because I can, and I'm shifting only a little bit. And the bonus content is around, okay, similar idea uh, when dealing with engineers, like how, how have I found um, when working with engineering, can you keep them uh, engaged and excited? So similar ideas, but just thinking differently about what an engineer's job is. Also figure out what an engineers like, okay? Are they front-end people? Are they back-end people? Do they love APIs? Are they into integrations? So by understanding this, this allows you potentially, now I know as a product manager, you probably don't have control over what tasks the engineers are working on, but it doesn't mean you can't make suggestions. It doesn't mean you can't recognize that, you know, way when you have like a front end uh, type, you know, a lot of front end work that's going on that you could talk to your, you know, the engineers that love that work about that and engage them and excite them because that's what they love to talk about all day long. And knowing that can be helpful. Same thing, you know, if it's just, APIs when it's time to you know start working on your suite of APIs so you know you become a you know a platform play and you can integrate with you know uh, partners that are out there same thing just under what I'm suggesting is similarly understand what turns your your the various engineers that you're working with or what, what excites them also understand their their style um as you at this point probably have, uh, discovered their engineers are, are a particular breed um they've a lot of them went into engineering for a reason. Okay, there's a reason that they were attracted to it and recognize that. So I've noticed that, you know, there are two types, okay, uh, or major buckets. And this is, you know, oversimplification. I admit that, but I'm just, you know, keeping it simple on purpose. Some engineers are highly collaborative, right? They want to talk. They want to talk it through. They want to understand the uh, all the details of why are we doing it? What is the benefit of it? Okay, how is this going to help our, our customers? How is this going to help us sell? I, I want to know everything and talk this through. And then I want to talk the solution through and make sure that what I'm thinking in terms of solution will make sense and the cost benefit makes sense. And then you have the opposite. You have the lone wolf style um, engineers that basically want to be given a set of tasks and then left alone for a week to get them done. And you almost like the don't bug me. Okay. Until, uh, you know, for a week, let me just go heads down and get this done and, and don't interrupt me because when you interrupt me, it just kills my flow. Right. So recognize how they work and try to be respectful of that and work within their style. Okay, don't try to change them. That's foolish. You're not going to change them. Okay, they are truly independent souls, the lone wolf style. You could get them a little bit more collaborative. Absolutely. Again, you make them fully collaborative, unlikely. That is, that is going to be unlikely. If their personality type is not collaborative, you're only going to take them so far. Are they a leader or are they more of a, you know, wanting to take orders, right? Factor that in too. Some engineers just, again, want to want to be given, need to be given, you know, specific direction to succeed while others have, you know, a, a greater leadership style where they actually, you know, want to, you know, take control of certain parts of the product and, and you know, even lead others. And those engineers often become engineering um, managers, okay, as well and lead engineers and you know, that, that type of role. Um, uh, but just recognize, you know, again, same thing. Think about their style in terms of, is this person want to lead or do they, are they looking to be led? Again, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be led. That's not a bad thing, especially in the engineering function. Okay, if, if they're willing to just like take on large chunks of work with very specific, you know, expectations and go just do this, that that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. There are times in projects where, that person can be more valuable than someone who wants to be a leader. Um, I won't go into why, because that could be a whole other hour conversation. Well, I think this is my, if I remember right, my last slide on, on engineering. Here, here's an important one, especially, especially, and this is for those uh, product people that came up through, um, that were an engineer themselves. That's my point. Don't do their job for them. Okay. Engineers can be very particular and sensitive to when you, try to tell them like how to design, technically design the product. So if you can do that, and I know if you were an engineer, you could don't just in the same way. And here's why, 
So in the same way, you as a product person would be frustrated when an engineer looks at your roadmap and says to you, um, no, no, that's definitely wrong. We should do number four before, um, before number one. That's just, that's just ridiculous. We have to do number four. I don't know where, where you came up with this order, but that's just, that's just wrong. Okay, right? It's a product person. You wouldn't take too kindly to that because let's assume for the moment of that roadmap, a lot of research went into it. You've done your due diligence. You've spoken to tons of customers. You're looking at what the com competition is doing. Okay, there's there's rational rationale to your backlog. You wouldn't want to have an engineer telling you like it's you know how to do your job. Okay, right. Same thing. Don't tell them you know how to design their 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 software. Um, you'll you'll end up frustrating them. And you know, again, it also plays into the goals, not processes and procedures. As product people, it's our you know role to definitely tell them. What do we need to build, but not how to technically build that product? Just stay away from that if you, if, if, you know, even if you can. Now, that being said, I don't think there's any harm in suggesting things to them. And I can tell you as someone that I was not an engineer, however, um, throughout my career, I, I found that I have a particular skill set in uh, database design. Okay, it's something I'm actually good at. I, I don't know how that came to be, it just was. So I am very happy to make. Um, potential data modeling suggestions to them. And the only you know, reason I do that is not because I don't think they're going to get to the right end game. It's usually in the vein of, hey, keep this in mind. We might want to do the data model this way because I know in the future, we're going to want to be doing these kinds of business intelligence type solutions or we're going to want to be able to run these kinds of um, analyses on the data and if we don't structure it a certain way and if we don't have standardization in the data and things of that matter i think it's going to make that really hard so factor that in and here just and I, it's just a suggestion right and it's always couched in the vein of a suggestion um so also this is all in the in the vein of respecting their craft in the same way you expect them to respect yours and i recovered right this is especially true if you're an engineer and that Mostly wraps this up, and I'm going to do just a quick summary because I know I always feel like I'm downloading people with an incredible amount of information. And look, if you're going to walk away with just a few key takeaways, here's here are the, the key takeaways. Um, I just to help you out in terms of well, what did I what did I get out of this? So in terms of trying to figure out, you know, hey, how do I get you know the, again getting the most out of uh, product people? Think about what are they like, what are they good at putting them on the, the right product, the right role, potentially the right team. Focus on their giving them outcomes, not the output and the processes and procedures around that. And lastly, try to put value on everything they do and make sure they appreciate that value. Thanks everybody for your time. As always, the presentation will be posted to our SlideShare channel. And a big thank you from me, Chris Butler, to everyone that joined today uh, and the Product Mentor. And don't forget, if you're interested in being a Product Mentor like Jordan, uh, the product people of all sorts have joined and visited theproductmentor.com to sign up today. Um, also, if you're looking to fill a new product job with a great product person, visit our very own free for everybody job board at theproductjobs.com.